What's up guys, it's Kicter. I'm here with my beautiful girlfriend Stitch and we are going to be talking about Yu Wu 2. I am once again asking, Yu Wu, what's this? <laughs> it's the story of a golden retriever boyfriend gone wrong. Yeah, we're still working on getting him potty trained. I don't know. <laughs> is he, so, is weird. He's, he's still a dog? He's still basically a dog, yeah. Damn. Yeah. Okay. We're working on it though. We're making some good progress. We're making good progress here. Okay. Let's start with where we last left off. Looks like Chu Anning. Yes, okay. So, Moshi is in the middle of fighting a sword spirit that has been going around serial killing young woman. Okay. Very bad. He's with a junior. He's got um, Gumong's ex-boss there, like, and they are working on subduing the sword spirit when Chu Anning shows up. Okay. Not actually Chu Anning. It could but be because it's in the same universe yeah, as Yeah, I know. It's a little bit interesting because this Chu Anning lookalike is um, the uncle of uh, Yue Chen Qing, who is the little junior boy who just absolutely adores him. And he is exactly like Chu Anning in the sense that he is an artificer, which means he works on mechanical things, oh, magical mechanical objects. Automatons. Yes, and uh, he has no feelings. He oh. is an absolute dick. Is that where an emotionally stunted Dan Mei man minding his business and me every damn time comes in? <laughs> yes, I am infatuated with him purely on the basis of his good looks and emotional unavailability. We love that in a Dan Mei man. <laughs> Only in a Dan Mei man, but we do love it. So he shows up. And he immediately like fixes everything. They uh, subdue the sword, maybe not the spirit because they still have some things to deal with there. And they immediately go into a uh, thank you meat bun extended dream sequence where we unlock the very sad backstory of the sword spirit guy whose name is Li Qingqian. And he has a very sad, tragic backstory before he became a serial killing sword. <laughs> Which is not surprising. <laughs> okay. I can forgive a Dan Mei serial killer as long as they have a sad backstory. And this one is sad. <laughs> this one is real sad. I can forgive serial killing, but I will not forgive misogyny. <laughs> but can he forgive himself? <gasps> oh. I didn't come here to cry over a straight couple, but here we are. Yeah. So the sword spirit is this guy named Li Qingqiang. And he, in life, was known to be like an amazing cultivator. He is so noble, and he was like had this amazing sword technique. And he kind of went around selflessly, doing good everywhere. And then he unexpectedly dies a horrific death. Oh. Um, and this appears, and no one knows what happens. And uh, apparently, this is what happens to him. He becomes a demonic sword spirit. And where that all starts is back in his youth. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's like, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. And um, everyone in his village is horrifically slaughtered. As it happens. As it, as it happens. And um, his mother is uh, raped and killed in front of him. And he is hiding in the closet with his little brother. Oh, God. Yeah. Forget what happens to the little brother. <laughs> Probably not important. <laughs> And this mysterious masked cultivator in green shows up. Shen Qing Chu. <laughs> shows up and um, kills the guys who were killing everybody. Okay. So Kai swoops in, saves the day, and um, is about to walk off. And he's like, oh my god, please help me. And he gives him the sword cultivating manual. And mm. is like, good luck. <laughs> Which I wish. <laughs> Which I mean, fair enough. He's already saved his life, I guess, because okay. he was about to get killed. He's like, I'm busy. Learn it yourself. Yeah. So he does that, um, and he starts cultivating um, and kind of wandering the land, doing good. And he runs into this girl named Hong Xiao. And Hong Xiao, sorry, I was like, Hong, Hong Xiao. Xiao. <laughs> me, me, me. Hong Xiao, Hong, Hong me, 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 me. Yes. <laughs> and she is also not having a great time. She has been kind of been bounced around. She was like... Um, she was in an arranged marriage and then like that didn't work out so she ended up being adopted by this like farmer's family and then she's kind of once again being basically sold off and it's just like she has no home, she has no family and he rescues her and she's just like please take me with you and him being rather kind-hearted ends up taking her with him. Mm. And so these two end up traveling together and they are both um, they both develop feelings for each other, 
but they're both too awkward and innocent to really do anything about it. So Aww. they have this sort of like familial best friends sort of relationship um, where they clearly feel very deeply about each other, um, but don't do anything about it. Um, but then Hong Xiao falls um, sick mm. and it's kind of like a magical sickness where, <laughs> <laughs> oh, as one does. <laughs> And Don May, I don't know, you know. You just get magically sick one day. Magically sick. I mean, sick. that's kind of how it works in the real world, too. Yeah, and you magically need magical medicine. Um, so, like, there is medicine for um, her sickness or poisoning or whatever, but it's expensive. And he's uh, broke. Oh, no. So they keep traveling together. Time but... to rob. <laughs> <laughs> but he cannot rob. He's a good person, right? If... I know you would rob. No, 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 no. <laughs> if I were sick, you're saying you wouldn't rob me? <laughs> okay, we'll pretend that conversation didn't happen. If we were in happen. a Dan May world and you were sick, I would rob. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm just screwed if I get sick in this world then and you wouldn't rob for me. Okay, okay. Um, so she's just sick and she's not getting better and he is like getting more and more desperate and he will do anything but rob apparently <laughs> to save her. Um, but then he runs into uh, this big fuss in town and they're saying, hey, if there are any pretty young girls who look kind of like this, insert portrait of pretty young girl here, they are like, the stars are aligned and they are, they're destined to become priestesses. Um, and they will live like, a, you just have to sign them up here. You can get like a bunch of money for it and they will become priestesses and live happily ever after. Well, this sounds bad. It does sound bad, doesn't it? They're gonna become prostitutes or something. That would be I better than what happens, actually. Oh. <laughs> so, um, anyways, the portrait looks pretty close to what Hong Xiao looks like, with like different moles and different spots, and it's like, wow, this is really coincidental. Mm. But um, he goes back and forth, and he realizes that this may be her only chance of getting medicine okay. and being taken care of. He even asked, like, hey, if I know this girl, like, what if she's sick? Like, can you help her? He's like, oh, psh, yeah. Like, we'll just, we'll give, we'll give her anything. The, the weaker, money is the better. Yeah, the money means nothing to us. Like, we just want girls who look like this to sign up. And so he goes to her and tries to break this news to her, being like, hey, if you just... I'm selling if, you to One Direction. If we just sell you to One Direction... <laughs> This would solve a lot of our problems. And she's like, I would rather die than leave you. Oh. And he's like, and he's thinking, I would rather. He's like, you are going to die. He's like, you like, are literally going to die and I cannot bear to see you die. And so he, can you guess what he does? He sells her to One Direction. Yes, he does. But he, instead of it being like, I love you and I cannot bear for you to come to any harm because I am just, you know, poor and can't take care of you properly as like, a would-be husband might be able to do properly. He's like, you know what? You're actually a burden to me. Yeah, he had to break up with her so he, that she would actually go and get help. Yep, classic. It's like, you're a burden to me. Think about what position this puts me in. You're holding me back. All the things she secretly was thinking to herself, um, he says out loud. That's so sad. And he's lying. But this really hurts her particularly. Not because that's just like a shitty thing to do, but because um, her backstory is that she has always been a burden. She has always been like given up. Someone's always shoved her off onto the next person. And like for once she has just wanted like a home and someone who would not give up on her no matter what. Like she would genuinely rather die than not even just to be with him because she loves him, but she would rather die than just be given up as a thing. Right. To be sold to one direction. But he genuinely thinks yes. he's gonna save yes. her. And he doesn't necessarily like really recognize the trauma that she's been through yeah. of being like just kind of passed off from one thing to another. It's like this hurts for now but it's better It'll for be the better. End. Yes. Yeah. So he does that and he takes the money that they give him and um, they are separated and all she is thinking as they part ways is that she just wants him to look back one more time to show that she mattered. And yeah. He doesn't look back because it hurts too much. <laughs> It hurts because love does exist. <laughs> Thank you, Thandral. <laughs> and so that's sad. But, you know, at least things get better from here, right? Are you no. crying? Yes, I am. You're tearing up. <laughs> oh, oh, for a straight couple? It's a new low for me. <laughs> 
because what happens is all of these girls are um, rounded up and uh, killed in a virginal sacrifice sort of deal to a mountain spirit. <laughs> so after he hears about what happened to like all of these priestesses, he doesn't know what happened to Hong Xiao. So he goes to this mountain, he gets all of these like ghosts of these brides who were sacrificed and he goes to an island and he starts releasing all their spirits one by one, hoping to God that Hong Xiao is not among them because he doesn't know what happened to her. Right. And then the very last ghost that he releases is Hong Xiao. And after that, is she mad? Oh, she's not happy. She's not happy at all. <laughs> her last words before her death are like captured in her ghost form. And so like, as he's releasing this last ghost, he hears Hong Xiao say, turn around, Daga, I want to say a proper goodbye. All she wanted, her dying wish, was that he would just turn around as he left her so that she could say goodbye to him properly. And he didn't even give her that. That's so sad because it's just a misunderstanding and it just it hurts. It does. Oh. They, like, they couldn't connect properly. Like They never got a chance to like love each other in life even though they cared about each other. So is she like alive as a ghost or is she just kind of like... She's kind of... She's not like responding to him. She doesn't know what's happening. She's kind of... It's just kind of like the ghost of her is like frozen in that time of her death. And so... Um, she's not like she's not, powerful or no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She's not consciously like aware of her surroundings. So he just needs to release her. Yeah. So he has to just say goodbye to her then. And, and then he's like... Fuck this, I'm gonna go kill the bastard responsible for this. Right. And so he goes and finds the Guoshi of the Lao Kingdom, the high priest of this demonic cultivating land. And the Guoshi was responsible for rounding up all the priests. Yep, he as a priest was kind of hiring priestesses and that's what got everyone into this mess. Why did they need specific girls that looked a certain way? That's a great question, cause you'd think it wouldn't really matter, right? Yeah. So. When um, Li, Li Qingqian hears about this, he immediately goes to the high priest responsible. This is the high priest of the, um, of the Liao kingdom. This is like the demonic cultivating kingdom that eventually becomes responsible for Gumong becoming a furry. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Against his will. Um, and he, he goes in with his sword and he's ready to kick ass and he's like, explain yourself. Why did this happen? How could you let this happen? What was the point of this? So, we're gonna learn a little bit about the Guoshi of the Lao Kingdom now. Next slide. Oh, the hottie. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the little, the mask with the ears in a non-furry way. Do not at me. <laughs> really? In a non-furry way? <laughs> Come on, they look cool. Okay, mostly it's the hair. It's the way the bangs are like going over. It's like, you know what? You know I'm weak to that. I, you are weak to that. You are weak to hair. <laughs> All Goshi's know is wear a mask, teach cultivation, kill the people most important to you, eat hot chip and lie. <laughs> <laughs> Not naming any names, Function Goshi. But uh, there's some stunning similarities. However, that's so funny. Isn't it? <laughs> like what is with Goshi's just Wearing masks? Was that like part of the shtick? The job requirements? <laughs> Anyways, this guy is the fucking devil. <laughs> he looks so hot though. I, okay. I'm gonna say he's wait. not going to be hot after I explain to I you was how bad say, he is. But then if he is wait, hot wrong. after this, I don't know what to tell you. I was about to say, let me say how hot he is before I learn how okay. not hot he is. Get it all out now. While you he can. just looks so hot. <laughs> Okay, now ruin him forever. <laughs> okay. There's misogyny, isn't there? There really is! How did you guess? <laughs> um, so this guy has bitches, right? He's the high priest. He's got like a bunch of like priestly maidens already. So the backstory on this guy is that once upon a time, one of his priestesses, presumably like, I don't really know if they're having like relations <laughs> like or anything, but like he has an entitled ownership over like the woman working for him. Okay. And apparently one of the, these women disrespected him by like either rejecting him or like, le like kind of leaving his services to go marry like a man outside in the world. Okay. And he takes that real personally. Um, just the disrespect from this one woman who happens to look a little bit like Hong Xiao oh and all these God. other young women. That's so cringe of him. It is. And so just to kind of like 
just because he's still tracking her down, by the way. He still wants to find her. And the, like, the OG. Yeah, the OG. This and is so, like <laughs> Jung Chung hunting down any... Oh my god, this is like yeah, yeah, Jung Chung Wei Wuxian behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so this was in an effort to kind of like find her a little bit, but also just an effort to really punish anyone who remotely resembles her. Like Christian Grey punishing all women that look like his mother. Exactly like that. This must be a real psychological thing that people do, right? I God, I hope not. <laughs> um, I hope I look like nobody. <laughs> I hope I look like nobody that has ever made anyone mad. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I apparently look like the most generic lesbian possible. <laughs> so he's like, okay, I get that. What's up with like sacrificing them all in the mountain? God, he's like, oh, that was just a random mountain. I just killed them for no reason. Like, there was no sacrifice to appease any mountain spirit. You didn't like, even get anything cool out of it. You didn't get anything cool out of it. Like, there was, you know, originally there was, like, some sort of, like, fucked up demonic cultivation reasoning put out there. But, like, this was literally gratuitous murder. Yeah. He's just like, I just fucking hate front bangs. Yeah. Wow. He did all that. And he's gloating over it. He thinks it's so funny. Mm -hmm. And... It's um, all because deep down he's a little bitch baby who got slighted. Mm -hmm. And then, at that moment, Li Qingqian realizes that this masked cultivator in green looks a little familiar. It's the guy that taught him the sword technique? Sure does. And so when he goes to attack this Woshi with his sword technique, he's like, fucking first grade Spongebob. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And kicks his ass. Oh my god, so this guy saved him originally, taught him the sword, he was able to become the man he was because of this. Uh, oh my the god. The guy he venerated as a hero, this mysterious person, is actually fucking the devil. He's so it turns out, you should really change up your color scheme every couple of years, unless you want some of your past <laughs> to come fuck you over in the future. It's true! <laughs> he learns that, he figures out who the Guoshi is, and then the Guoshi kills him. Wow. Yep. I'd become a malicious sword spirit too. Right? You just had like a terribly sad life. Anytime there's kind of a, a seemingly random arc, it's nice to kind of con connect it back to why are we hearing the story? Like what does the story mean to us as the reader? And um, Yu Wu makes it like very clear that this love story um, has significance because it's meant to kind of compare it to the love story between Gumang and Moshi. And Moshi is like seeing these memories and experiencing this story. And he himself like observes that it's very similar to what he went through with Gumang. Okay. Moshi rose, his eyes swept over the group's sleeping forms. The medicine hadn't yet worn off for the others. Finally, his gaze landed on Gumang who remained unconscious as well. Moshi's heart felt painfully tight. He couldn't help but think that he and Gumang were the same, separated by the yawning chasm of class, crushed beneath the resentment of their homeland. Gumang couldn't bear that pain, and so he had left Moshi. In the end, Moshi was the one who had been left behind. But perhaps the relationship couldn't be compared to that of Hong Xiao and Li Qingchen. Perhaps Moshi and Gumang were never holding hands in the first place. Perhaps it was Moshi who had clung to Gumang's fingers out of that wishful, unrequited love, demanding that he stay and refusing to let him go. He didn't actually know if Gumang's declarations of love had been sincere. So, in this sense, Moshi is resonating with the girl in the story. Yeah. The one who was left behind by Gumang. Damn. And it's interesting to note that, like, for Hong Xiao and Li Qingqian, they were separated by poverty, essentially. That's what forced them apart. Yeah. And in Gumang and Moshi's case, it was classism that separated them. And so there's these big societal issues. Society! Society <laughs> is ruining love for the gays and the streets. Who else is there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was so that's kind of why this arc is is in the story, I think. What's interesting though is that what um, what everyone kind of figures out after seeing this extended flashback is that what happened to his spirit dying this horrific death is that um, essentially his soul r took on like kind of the the personality of the Guoshi. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, like he had such a resentment towards him. He became him. He became him. Oh. And so like in his mind, he's going around and like killing these women because um, the Guoshi is the so one, in his head. Is the one who wants to find this woman who betrayed him. Oh my god. And in a sense, um, Li Qingqian also wants to find this woman who betrayed 
like him because he's kind of misdirecting his hatred he's like like oh you're the reason why this is all happening like i'm gonna it. kill you because this is all your fault even though it's all the guoshi's fault yeah does he find her he certainly does does she kick his ass <laughs> so everyone's after everyone like gets out of this dream sequence and like oh shit we know who this woman is oh it and it's madame young who um, owns the brothel? No. Oh. Who owns... <laughs> Madame Young is the wife of a very cold-hearted, um, unromantic uh, medicine master who is known um, for his terrible personality. Is and he the guy that she left the guo she yep. to be with? <laughs> with this, so that's the crazy thing. She left him to be with like an absolute kind of dickhead. Like he's just known for being like... Yeah, c kind of a guy who cares only about money. Okay. And it's like, why would the most beautiful woman in the world go off with She's this like, guy? I was with the devil. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is an upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and so it's kind of like, it is interesting and it kind of makes you think that maybe there's something more to the story. Like, why is she with this man? Like, mm -hmm. is there some, is there something wrong with her? He has like, a really big dick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was thinking like, Free medical care? Like, like, oh, oh, free health care? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so, anyways. Um, Does she have the mystical illness that something happens? Okay. Right. right. So, um, Li Ching Chun is still on a rampage in the town. Like, they, they kind of, they, they got the sword, but they got, didn't quite get the whole spirit. Okay. So, he's off um, burning down the town. And they're like, well, I guess we should go stop him because he's going to kill this woman. Mm -hmm. So, they go to find um, Madame Jung. And they're like... The sword's trying to kill you, man. Yeah, and she's like, I'll go talk to him. He's like, no, you will not. And she's like, trust me, I'm going to go talk to him. And you're like, oh, what? Okay. Wait, so, is the original Guoshi still alive? Yeah. Does he know that the sword is going around on his... I think so. I okay. think that was kind of part of his... He's just kind of like evil cool. business. He's yeah. like, yeah, okay. evil business, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and he's still looking for yeah. this woman. So, so she's going to go talk to the sword spirit. So she's going to go talk to the sword spirit. And everyone's like, he's going to kill you. And she's like, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So she's super cool. Okay. So Madame Jung, for a little context, is always veiled in public. And she rarely actually leaves like the inner chambers of the medicine master's house. So she's a very reclusive, mysterious figure. What is she hiding? Probably her identity because a crazy <laughs> girl she is out, out there trying to get her. Ah, uh, fair. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, she's very yeah. respected, um, very wealthy. Um, but not seen often. Okay. Nobody really gets an audience with her. But she comes out to talk to the sword spirit, who is like r still raving mad, and like sees her and immediately wants to kill her to solve his problems. Uh, but she's like, hold up, just let me tell you one thing. And she whispers in his ear, and he kind of loses it he starts kind of laughing maniacally he's like oh my god no way i can't this is like this is so backwards this is like this is crazy you know what it was <laughs> it was go oh, she has a small dick <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's driving me crazy like we don't know what she said to him okay we don't know if we're ever gonna know like we don't know like what secret she's hiding like either about her or about Guoshi. like this is, it's just so crazy. I don't know, I don't know what on earth is going on there or when that will come back into the story. Okay. But he, he is not going to kill her. He loses his desire to kill her. He's like, that's hilarious. Yes. Dap me up. Basically. <laughs> By the way, sorry for breaking the whole fucking village. <laughs> yeah, everything's on fire around them. It's crazy. And he's just like, wow, joke's on me, I guess. He like reclines like in her house. So what are we having for dinner? <laughs> So they're able to take care of the sword spirit after that. Kind of crisis averted. Okay. Um, but uh, not before they have to deal with the raging inferno that the downtown market has become. <laughs> Boshi's mystery mouse couture. <laughs> a whale? Yep. <laughs> so Moshi is like a fire type Pokemon cultivator. <laughs> okay. So... He's not really the person you want to send in to stop a fire. He's like, I make the fires. I do not put out the fires. I'm but since he is incredibly OP, uh -huh. he still manages to have another magical weapon that is perfect for this. Oh, good. Yes. And it's a giant fucking whale. <laughs> he pulls out this magical scepter and its name is Tian Tian. And sky, sky. <laughs> Maybe sky whale? I don't know. <laughs> 
and out of it comes this beautiful blue light and the spirit of this giant fucking whale. <laughs> really? It's huge. That's awesome. It's, giant. it's so cool. One of my favorite tropes in the whole world is sky whales. I was gonna say, like, okay, it's a thing. there was an era in like 2014 on Tumblr when like there were whales in the sky and there was that episode of Doctor Who where the ship was actually a whale. And if you've seen the movie The Boy and the Beast, there's a giant sky whale. I highly recommend. I just love, I love a whale in the sky. We love a whale in the it's sky. It's the best thing ever. So he whips it out. It freaking causes a big like windstorm and like freaking the just blasts the inferno out. And this is so powerful that like every cultivator in like the vicinity is brought to their knees by like the sheer like spiritual power of this weapon. Cool. And he's just like, yeah, I don't use it very much. <laughs> what? He's like, I don't even need it. This is one of like my backup weapons. How did he like cultivate that? I have no clue. <laughs> he's just so cool. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can, I can, I can uh, describe it because it really is cool, and I think it's. It a, was a big ass whale. I. I that, yeah, it sounds a little cooler. <laughs> Tian Tian, come! A clarion whistle pierced the air like a whale's call ringing through the abysmal ocean. <gasps> <laughs> yeah, this, like, you just hear like a big whale moan, like Dor like Dory going. <laughs> If he had to like call it like Dory from Finding Nemo, yeah. come out, <laughs> way up, please come out. <laughs> A lustrous white scepter appeared in Moshi's palm. It's it's finial. Wow, we're learning scepter anatomy today. Its finial was woven from gold and silver, and it was inlaid with a dazzlingly precious spirit stone imbued with the soul of a whale. Which <laughs> how the fuck did you get the soul of a whale into your scepter? <laughs> oh no, there's like problematic whaling in this anime economy. <laughs> oh no, which shone with a magnificent blue light. Tian Tian was Moshi's most powerful holy weapon. In most cases, a spoken command was sufficient to wield earth-shaking power. Because Tian Tian was too strong, Moshi usually only employed it to conjure a defensive barrier. He rarely summoned Tian Tian as a scepter. The logic behind this was simple. Defense only required the giant whale's spiritual form. But when the scepter was called, it was to cast spells. So it's like, the big guns are out. Yeah. And so... Gripping the scepter with slender, pale fingers, Moshi pointed it at the soaring field of flame. Rain transformation. A young cultivator gasped, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. That's so funny. Everyone's just like losing their mind because it's like, how could a fire type cultivator extinguish fire? Everyone's just losing their mind. It's Giant like blowhole. <laughs> A beam of blue light burst from the tip of the scepter and shot straight into the sky where it transformed into a colossal whale. With a stroke of its tail, it rushed open mouths toward the fire. It's gonna a eat it. Yeah, literally. A fierce gale instantly swirled to life, lifting sand and pebbles into the air. Many of the cultivators on the scene couldn't bear the surge of spiritual energy and fell to their knees one after another, pain written plainly on their faces. Yeah, it's wow. epic. This is like when Galadriel from Lord of the Rings does <laughs> anything. <laughs> Literally. The massive cerulean whale clashed with the rocking sea of fire. Plumes of foam and furious gusts of wind came forth one after another as waves and flames surged for a hundred miles. In an instant, the dark night lit up bright as day. A deluge of rain thundered down to soak the entire breadth of Changhua's capital. He just called in a monsoon, like covered the whole city for a hundred miles. <laughs> Moshi's face was, by the way, he's hot. <laughs> we have to go throw in a paragraph about how he's hot. Moshi's face was pale as precious jade amid the torrential rain. Blue light and red fire chased each other through his eyes as his black imperial leathers whipped in the wind. Ooh. Also, they were describing like his pale, thin fingers on the scepter. Like, I caught that meat bun. Meat bun knows where it's at. Yeah. She will never, no matter what kind of action is going on, she will not let you forget that he is fucking hot while he's being <laughs> awesome. <laughs> In the blink of an eye, the fire succumbed to the waves, the tongues of flame beaten back like a thousand strong cavalry in retreat. The inferno subsided into a smoldering wreck, unable to flare up or dance any longer. Those cultivators lucky enough to personally witness this feat stared at Moshi's back, too shocked to stammer out a single word. Each harbored different feelings in their reeling hearts. The male cultivators thought, oh god, the women of Chonghua are going to go even crazier over this man. <laughs> he has a whale? <laughs> The female cultivators thought, ah! Stop. <laughs> it's written right here. <laughs> oh my god. I love how after witnessing this great show of power, they're like, fuck, we're never gonna... The woman in this 
in this country are going to go insane. We're never going to get laid when whale guys are around. Literally. Oh my god. Yeah, so that was just awesome. That is awesome. That's like one of my favorite parts of the whole book. What, random ass whale. Random ass sky whale. That's so cool. So that happened. And then that's the end of that arc. Wow. Very much. Yeah, that was a good mystery mouse katool. It really was. We made it to the first boner. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. Aw. Huh. So good news. Boner time. <laughs> Is he still a dog? Wrong guy having a boner. It's still wrong to get a boner if the other guy's a dog. <laughs> no, no. I can explain. I can make this right. <laughs> He's only, like, kind of a dog. Okay. I mean, he's technically all human. He's just a furry. <laughs> Furries it. deserve boners, too. Stop it. Okay, okay. Okay. So you may be wondering, how did we get here? This whole thing over the sword spirit was all a fight over Gumon. Moshi wants to, like, take control of him as a prisoner and have authority over him. And uh, Gumon's old master, Murong Lian, also wants to have that privilege. He's the one who was responsible for like throwing him into the brothel and yada yada. So he's not a good guy to be trusted with Gumon. Clearly doesn't have good intentions. Right. And so these two both were like wanted to volunteer as tribute to take care of him. And the emperor was like, I don't know, make it entertaining for me. Whoever <laughs> finds the sword spirit guy, gets him under control, can have him. Okay. And the emperor is legitimately that kind of guy. He's kind of lackadaisical. It's kind of funny. He literally is just kind of bored and kind of finds it entertaining to like fuck with people. So this is very in character for him. It's kind of <laughs> funny. Uh, so Moshi wins after all this, the yeah. right to take Gumong home and uh, watch over him. And so uh, he gets to do that. And when he goes to fetch Gumong and get him home, he finds that Gumong has been kind of trussed up. He's tied with rope and he has a gag in his mouth. No. And. <laughs> The sight of him like this. No. <laughs> no, that's so bad. No. Uh, brings to mind some old memories. Oh my god. Of just what Gumong was like in bed. Oh my god. Uh, and we, we just gotta give Moshi some grace here because he had to deal with Gumong being an absolute bottom. Like, even though Gumong was his gaga who tried to take care of him. Once they got into bed, it was all over, and Gumong was absolutely, like, here's his defining characteristic, okay? He is a crier. <sighs> he, not only is he a major bottom, but, like, he cries in bed. We love a Gaga who cries in bed. It's kind of great for Moshi. I'm, pr I'm happy for him. <laughs> but, like, so he just has this, like, pa like, there's a couple pages devoted to, like, him having, like, horny memories of, like, Gumong just, like, sobbing in bed and being, like... <sighs> Like, into it, crying. Yeah. Like, not like hurting. We're not no, getting no, off no, on hurting no, no. anyone. It's yeah. like, I'm so sensitive, and I just can't control myself. It's the ultimate form of being a bottom. Absolutely. Yeah. And we love that for Gumong, and we love that for Moshi. Um, but just seeing him kind of, like, all tied up and sort of in this That's vulnerable... That's so twisted. It's kind of... <laughs> I want to defend Moshi, but... It's like, I understand why that happened, dear God. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Um... And so he has to endure this whole carriage ride with like he Moshi is having like a major hard on over this like I've just he got him on the wrong train of thought left the station, um, and he's like actually I I don't even want to see you I don't want anyone else to see you like this even though I'm clearly the only one who would have horny thoughts over you over this, um, so he kind of just like knocks him out and like so that he can be untied and like go about his day normally, uh, dear God but yeah. Oh my god. I'm just god. like, oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> yep, it was. It <laughs> oh, Meat Bun, we oh, love meat you. Meat Bun. <laughs> Nobody does it like Meat Bun. So uh, after that, uh, let's, uh, to get our minds off of that, I have a little pop quiz for you. Okay. If you want to go to the next slide. Pop quiz. Which of the following are nicknames of Moshi? Pretty Boy, Stepdad, Princess, Whale Immortal. I'll give you a hint. There's two correct answers. Two real nicknames in here. Well, I'm going to say Whale Immortal because we just learned about his whale. Okay. Is it Princess? Is it Princess? <laughs> yes, it is. Oh my god. Oh my god. 
Uh, and there is a whole scene dedicated to that little thing. Who is calling him princess? Okay, so... Back in the flashback days between Gu Meng and Moshi, um, as, as is Gaga, Gu Meng calls him his precious little princess. He's wow. Like, like, you're my precious little He's princess. I gotta there. take care of you. He's out there calling him the precious little princess, and the precious little princess is fucking him into submission. Yes, isn't that great? It's like I, the best of both worlds. I love that for them. It's so cute because, like, genuinely, like, on the streets, Gu Meng is, like, working hard. He's literally, there's this whole scene where, like, um, Gu Meng has this reputation for, like, going out and, like, partying, going to brothels and stuff, like, in, like, neighboring villages, wherever the army is and stuff. He's got this whole party boy... Gu Meng? Yeah. Yeah. But what he's actually doing when he says he's going off to brothels um, is he's going to like work in like as a dishwasher in kitchens to earn extra money oh. so that he can like buy like good food for Moshi to have. Oh my god. Because there's not a lot of like rations and Moshi comes from like a noble background where he's been well taken care of. And they're all suffering, but Gu Meng's like, I'm tough, I can take it. But like, I want to take care of my precious little princess. <gasps> and so when Moshi finds out about this, because obviously he's not happy about him going out to brothels. So he goes and tracks down where he is and he finds out that he's been like working himself to the bone. Like his hands are cold and chapped and oh my like God. it's the middle of winter. They're all cold and starving. And he's been working hard just so that he has a little extra food to eat. And he's like, why would you be doing this? And it's because he's his princess. He's like, oh God, take care of her. Like, it I is, thought you were coming home tired because you were sleeping with so many bitches. But turns out, I'm your bitch. <laughs> it's true. It's so sweet. Wow. Like, Gumong genuinely, like, back in the Dize, had such a soft spot for him because, like, this is his... I love that shit. Like, he's, like, he's, like, being his gaga is, like, his crowning achievement. And it's really sweet, especially because, like, Gumong is, like, a slave. And yeah. that is his background, and that's... That was his social status. Like, even in the army, like, like he's not treated as well as other people. Being, like, Moshi's gaga and Moshi, like, treating him genuinely as this kind of, like, this elder brother, mentor, like, with army respect. guy. With, with a sort of respect, like, as, you know, like, being, like, in that position, like, he does want to, like, work extra hard and, like, like make him more comfortable and, like, do all these things where, like, it's almost, it's kind of demeaning himself, yeah. almost. But it's because... He has this special position where, like, Moshi does see him as his gaga, like, and even though he comes from a higher social standing. So, like, this kind of, like, role reversal, like, that they have, you know, where he wants to take care of him is so sweet. Oh, my God. It's really adorable. That is really sweet. Now, in the present timeline, Gu Meng, like, and him are, like, at this restaurant, and uh, Gu Meng call like... Gumong's under the table eating the scraps. He is. He's like, he's, he's, yep, that's the vibe here. And he calls him princess out of nowhere. And well, Moshi is like, like a bark. <laughs> and Moshi is like the Arthur meme, like, like clenched fist. Like, what did you just call me? Um, and he's like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Li Wei, the butler, like taught me that word. It's like, it's like for when someone's like really important and special, they're a princess. Because he's referring to like an actual princess because there's a character who's a princess yeah. in the book. But, and so it's just like a face palm moment. Like, no, that is not the word you meant to use. But it's like it totally sent him into like major, like, is it you? Are you in there? Yeah. Are you in there? Aww. It was so sad. He's gets, and Moshi gets really depressed after that. That's so sad. But it was also a really cute yeah. moment. Um, oh my god. It's like you need the deep sadness to unlock the sweet past that then makes you even deeply sadder. <laughs> oh, meat bun. <laughs> so, uh, Whale Immortal is not correct. I made that up. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Yeah. Um, the other correct answer is stepdad. <laughs> no! Don't worry. Gumong is not calling him that. <laughs> So, stepdad is, um, it used to be a, a derogatory nickname turned harmless nickname. So when they were in the army, Gu Meng, Gu Meng's, um, kind of military division that he was responsible of was called the Wangba Army. Like, okay. so those are his men, those are his soldiers. After things happened with him, um, Moshi volunteered to take command of the Wangba Army because these were men who were slaves, former yeah. slaves. So this was kind of like a, a something new that 
people were experimenting with and it was very like risky business of like can former slaves really be in the army or is this going to cause like a revolt or a riot yeah and so he volunteered to like command them okay and stuff so um years later um like gu mong even though he turned traitor he still has kind of like the, the the oldies in the army, you know, really remember him as being like their dad, you know. Mm -hmm. And so Mo Shi, who took over after him, and those two being really close, was called their stepdad. Oh my! You know. <laughs> and so even now, all these years later, like people who are in the Wangba army or used to be in the Wangba army, like see Mo Shi and they call him stepdad, kind of behind his back, not to his face, but like stepdad. And that's such a name that's still so tied to Gumong. It is. It wow. is. Wow. Because he took over. Like um, Gumong's rightful place is yeah. like their dad. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting, and it's kind of funny. It used to be kind of derogatory because they didn't like Moshi when he took over. Yeah, um, but it's like how no one likes their stepdad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but now it's kind of lost its original meaning. But it's still kind of funny because they see him in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Aww, it's funny. So like. He shows up, freaking blasts everything with a whale. Everyone's like, whoa, our stepdad is so cool and so <laughs> scary when he's mad. It's funny. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So now we're moving on uh, to after he takes uh, Gumong home, all sorts of hijinks ensue. Pet dog hijinks. Oh, Even, boy. Yes. Which is one part funny, one part sad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Moshi takes him home, and he asks his butler, Li Wei, uh, casually, so this is about no one in particular, but if you suspected that someone was acting crazy as a disguise, how would you reveal that they were lying and deceiving? So he thinks that the dog thing is an act. He does think, that he's still suspecting that the dog thing is an act. Okay. He's coping. Yeah. <laughs> and his butler Li Wei is like, we know who this is about. But because if I call you out, you are going to sulk about it for a week, I'm going to pretend I don't know who this is about. Right, Which right. is objectively hilarious. It's like, say I like this guy. Totally not. Literally. Yeah, literally yeah. the same type of conversation. Okay. And he's like, um, let's see. I would, uh, wow, I'm kind of, I'm feeling a little bit of laziness. Come on. I would love to have another servant to boss around. I would put him to work, my lord. And I would load him up with a bunch of chores. And if you give him a bunch of tasks to do, you know, he'll be so busy um, that he will, his facade is soon to drop. You know, he's going to mess up. You know, if he's so busy focusing on being in disguise, you know, having a bunch of other tasks to do, you know, okay. will mess him up. Okay. It's actually a good idea. Yeah. Uh, so he's like, sounds good. By the way, I'm bringing Gumong home. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes him home and Gumong immediately starts running amok and hiding in random places, such as a rice barrel in the cellar. And he's like, I thought you were gonna put him to work. And he's like, my lord, it's like a, having a stray cat in your home. You have to give him a few weeks to adjust before <laughs> oh. he stops hiding. I can't do anything with him right now. Oh and so ironically, the pet dog has become a pet cat in this moment. Uh, but he is running around, uh, and there is a bunch of really comedic scenes, in addition to him opening up the rice barrel being like, He's in there, putting the lid back on, walking away, hearing the lid clatter off, and he's turning around to see him like frozen midair of him climbing out, only to slowly retreat back into <laughs> the <rice barrel. laughs> Oh my god! Looney Tunes behavior. Literally Looney Tunes behavior. That's so and then um, Gumong like is like foraging food in the night, like stealing from the kitchen. And so Moshi wakes up in the middle of the night, looks out the window, and there is a Gumong holding a bunch of corn and he keeps one corn cob just drops out of his arm and so he like picks it up and then another will drop and he's like, caught oh in this God. vicious cycle of picking up corn which and Moshi just watches him and this is the love of his life <laughs> and his 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 most hated person on the planet and he's just like you stupid dumbass! <laughs> Could you just put the corn in the basket that you're also carrying? <laughs> oh my god. And then Gumong sees him and throws the corn at him and runs away. <laughs> it is so funny. Oh my god. And then Moshi is just like trying to have like a peaceful moment underneath a fruit tree in his courtyard. And there's like a squirrel rummaging around in the tree and like drops a fruit pit on him. He's like, what the fuck? And then 
course it's not a squirrel in the tree. It's Gumong shoving fruit into his mouth as fast as possible. <laughs> oh my god. He chases him out of the tree. It's hilarious. That is so funny. It's so funny. And then uh, at the same time, we're still like learning to teach him shot firewood and stuff. One night, Gumong uh, takes a bunch of furniture from everywhere in the house and piles it up in front of the woodshed to make a den. <laughs> In his beaver era. He's in his beaver era. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, and so that's all hilarious. But of course, Meat Bun has the power to make even this sad. Because part of the Emperor's conditions for Gumong, you know, being under his supervision is that he has to be collared as mm. a slave. This is not a dog thing. Although in this context, it feels like a dog thing. Yeah. Um, but slaves um, have to be like officially registered and they have to wear like a spiritual collar, which can't be removed. And that's kind of like a tracking. Dip. It's basically like chipping your dog. Yeah. Um, and so uh, this is something Moshi did not want to happen. Yeah. But he has to go do it. And it is the it is so traumatic. For, like Gumang doesn't know what's going on. But Moshi is like reliving this so emotionally because... He accompanied Gumong at one point in time to have his first slave collar removed. Mm. And like, ha because for Gumong originally, that collar was like his ultimate shame. And he fought his whole life just to like have equal status and to have that removed and to like, to be free of that. Yeah. And the day he got that removed was like the day of such happiness and freedom for him. And like Moshi was there to see that and... Now he's taking Gumong to have it put on. And for him, this this is just horrible. Yeah. And so he he um he watches it get put on Gumong and Gumong um uh, like kind of notices it and like like looks at it and then he looks at Moshi's like, Did you give me a necklace? And he's so happy. He's like, Thank you. And Moshi is torn. To shreds. Oh my god. That hurts my stomach so bad. <laughs> and it hurts so much. Even though Gumong feels no pain, it's because he feels no pain that Moshi is like, this is not this is not this right. is not him. Yeah. I know exactly what's going on here, and this is not the man that I loved and hated. Like this is nothing. Like he can't grieve, he can't cope, he can't feel any of the feelings that are like repressed so deeply in him because like, Gumong is just not himself. Yeah. And to the point where, like, the deepest core of him, which is this this desire not to be a slave, is gone. Yeah. To the point where, like, he can't even feel the feelings. You know, he wants him to, like, feel bad about this. Yeah, Because it would show that he is still, it's, the part of him is proof. real. That's not him. Yeah. And part of the part of the coloring thing is that, you know, his registration number has to be written on it, and the name of his master has to be written on it. And that would be Moshi's name. And Moshi draws a line. He's like, no, don't write it on there. Like, and he's like, no, like we have to put something on there. If, if not you, like a family name or like the name of the manor. He's like, don't write anything on there. Like he draws a line. He's like, he will not be considered Gumong's master. Like that to him is like, goes against everything he ever wanted for yeah. Gumong, which is really sweet. But like Gumong is like, why not? You're my lord. Like you, like you are... Like, you are, I want you to have put your name on there. Like, you gave this to me. This comes up again later where he, like, asks Moshi why he didn't want his name inscribed on the necklace. And, like, like arguing for it. Like, he actually wants that. Because, like, in Gu Meng's mind, like, he's a good person. And yeah. he gives him food. Yeah. And that's all you need. <laughs> um, so that's there's, so sad. So there's, um, there's a really, um... There's a really tender scene about this. As Gumong watched him, he slowly pulled his hands away from his ears. He was covering his ears, he didn't know. <laughs> and then raised them, this time to touch Moshi's face. His fingers were cold. For this, Moshi ought to have sharply rebuked him and pulled away. But against the backdrop of glowing lanterns and softly splashing oars, amid this anguish that had tormented him all day, or perhaps not just today, but ever since Gumong's defection, his lashes fluttered slightly, but he couldn't say anything harsh. Wetness gathered at the corners of his eyes. Princess, Gumong murmured, and then said inexplicably, Can I have your name on the back of the plaque? Because I seem to be a good person. He didn't expect Gumong to shake his head. No, he said, because I think I really did know you. 
Moshi felt like sharp talons had wrapped around his heart, even breathing hurt. Gumong said, I don't know what a lord is, but it sounds okay. I want it to be you. Moshi stared at him, his feelings impossible to describe. His heart was filled with a melange of emotions, piquant and volatile. He summoned all of his restraint to say, quiet and slow, you're far from worthy. What does worthy mean? Moshi tried another attack. What I mean is you can't. Gumong thought it over. Then what do I do to become worthy? Moshi couldn't respond. He stared at Gumong and only asked, can't you tell that I hate you? What's hate? Gumong asked, lost. Look into my eyes. I hate that I can't drink your blood, tear off your skin, and torture you to the brink with my own hands to make you suffer until you beg for death. Moshi stared at him coldly as he enunciated each word. That's hate. Gumong stared hard into his eyes. They were very close, their eyes fixed on one another's, their breaths mingling. Moshi found it inappropriate and was about to push him away when he heard Gumong say, But you look like you're in pain, like it really hurts. Hating me, it hurts you? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. That about sums it up, doesn't it? The dog understands your emotions. He's a service dog. <laughs> For his anxiety. That's so sad. Also, once again, parallels the straight story of like, I'm hating you. Yes. Because this is good for you. Yeah. That is so sad. If that ever happens to us, just be my master. <laughs> I'm okay with it. I'm saying it now. Just be my master. You don't have to pretend to hate me. <laughs> Good. Write your name on my neck right now. Yeah. Just hearing that genuinely like made my stomach upset. <sighs> and this book does that so well. It's like, good though. Yeah. I, this, oh. like, you makes my stomach twist with how much something is physically pain. Like, the emotional pain is so physical. Like, I feel it in my stomach when Moshi hurts. Yeah. When, like, Gumong just, like, stumbles into his feelings for him. And it just, it's so good. Like, out of, like, all the books I've been reading recently, like, this one has the most gut-wrenching angst in it. And it's so good, and I find it so satisfying or yeah. even enjoyable to read because it is all about love. It is. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like this hurts so much because it is real, because it is love. Thank you, Thandral. Thank you, Thandral. <laughs> <laughs> so got bested by the dog. Yeah, the fucking stupid dumb asking stupid questions. So <laughs> really, you're so mad right now. Why does it look like you want to kiss me? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't we get that version of Gumong? <laughs> Yeah, so that hurts a lot. Yeah, that does hurt. So after that all happens, um, Moshi is uh, losing some hope that the whole dog thing is an act. At this point, it's becoming less likely than ever. But he goes to Master Jung. So remember, we, we dealt with Madam Jung, um, the medicine master's wife. Well, yeah. Now he goes to the medicine master. Do you um, have any anti-dog pills? Yeah. Yeah, you got any pills that can help restore memories to someone who's missing a couple souls? And he's like, yeah, because I'm the fucking best, but it's gonna cost you a lot of money. He's like, I'm rich. Okay, so we got that figured out. Thank God. So he, yeah, thankfully Moshi is just rich. So he gets the very expensive medicine from the very expensive medicine master and uh, gives that to Gumong. And it's like, hey, keep an eye on him because it might take a while, but when it hits, he's gonna become a little unstable. Right. You know, because you don't know what he's going to remember. Yeah. Or what context he's going to be missing or not. Like, if he remembers that he hates the fucking emperor. He's going to suddenly go he's kill gonna the emperor. He's going to suddenly go kill the emperor. Okay. You know? So, um, takes some medicine. Nothing seems to be happening for a while, though. So, you know, uh, we, we don't really know where that's going to go. And Moshi doesn't really have any high hopes for it either after a while. Yeah. So, Gumong's memories, though, do start to come back. And the very first memory to come back in full? Sex. Next slide, please. What in the Wangshin? Gumong, drunk and stupid, Moshi, trying to have his birthday in peace. Yeah, so his first memory is about their first time. <laughs> oh my god! <gasps> oh, meat bun. How oh, we love you. Meat bun. <laughs> so let me go into the details. 
because this is great. Okay. <laughs> this is like if you like Wangshen, you're gonna love this because okay. it is some silly, goofy behavior. <laughs> so, it is Moshi's coming of age birthday. Big day. He's in the army though, and there's like, I mean, there's no, there's, he's not really celebrating himself. The only one who cares way too much about this is Gumon. Aww. He's like, I'm gonna make this the best day ever. So he gets wasted. <laughs> Moshi's not drinking. He's like, I gotta wake up early in the morning, man. And, but Gumong's like, I'm in party mode. And so he shows up at his tent, his place, I don't know, his dorm, I don't know. He shows up at his place, yeah. wasted. He's like, got you a present. Let's party. What is the present? This mouth on your dick. So close. <laughs> Try again, Wangshin style. <laughs> this scene particularly. This ass on your no! dick. <laughs> no! <laughs> We're getting there. Your sword. Stop. Okay. Okay, never mind. No more hints. I'll tell you. <laughs> He's like, happy coming of age. You're an adult now. Um, so I'll accompany you from being a boy to becoming a man. Here's some porn. And he's like, <laughs> he, brought, he brought him a book of porn. Straight porn. Wow. But he's like, here you go. And he's, he's like, like oh. do you like it? Would you like it if they were both met? <laughs> <laughs> and Moshi is like, uh, I hate it, actually. I'm really upset, actually. No, thank you, actually. I'm going to go stand outside in the cold and just <sighs> breathe for a little bit. And he's like, cool. And so he like flops down on his bed. He starts looking through like the porn he just bought <laughs> from Oshi. And he's like, okay, cool. Love that. Excellent. Flips to a random page. He's like, oh, shit. It's a threesome page but there's two men in it. Oh no. And he's like really fixating on the two men part. He's like covering the woman. Yeah, basically he's like, oh, I didn't know that was in there. And he's like, feeling some kind of way about this. Is this his own gay awakening? Gumong has having a little bit of a gay awakening there. So he's like, oh my God, this is hot. <laughs> there's no significance to that. It's fine. Uh, Moshi comes back and he's like, are you ready to just not be wasted and weird and horny? And he, but Gumong's like, we are going to read this together. Stop. <laughs> You're going to love this. I got something special to show you. <gasps> and so he's so excited about this. In his drunk mind, this is the best idea ever. And so they snuggle up together on his bed. And like Moshi is just like kind of just going along with this because Gumong is drunk and cannot be reasoned with. Gumong thinks he's, he's having the greatest idea ever. <laughs> They're like flipping through the pages. He's like, don't close your eyes. That's cheating. Oh my God. And, and then as they're getting closer to the page, the gay page, uh -huh. uh, Mo, like, Gumong starts having second thoughts. He's like, maybe this is a bad idea because I'm a little bit too invested in this. But it's too late. And so they reach the page and Moshi's like, oh, is this what you wanted to show me? And Gumong's like, I think I should be going. He's like, no, you're, you said you would stay here and see me become a man. So we're doing this. Oh my <laughs> God, Moshi like, totally power flips it. Yep, he's <gasps> like, nope, you got yourself into this mess and your actions have consequences. And Gumong's like, oh no. And like, they both are a little bit, like they're pressing into each other and they are both, they both have, Boners. <gasps> and it's like it's it's happening. Oh my god. And they just start making out. Oh my god! Wait, really? And one thing leads to another very quickly, and like Moshi is like, he is taking, he is topping from the get-go. He's like, he knows what he wants. Oh my god. And Gumong is so into it. <laughs> Gumong is just like, take me. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out I was gay a minute ago. Yes. And he's ready. He's like, he sped run the gay awakening. He's like, I am ready for this oh my gosh yeah and like i um, presumably that goes very well for them because like after that they have like a continued romantic relationship wow but it all happened that night well if you ever have a crush on someone just show them straight porn that is actually gay porn if you squint and kind of fold the page so you don't <laughs> see the woman yeah. That is so funny. I feel like that also is like weirdly like 
a realistic scenario. It th- okay, it, like it was crazy, but like it did feel genuinely realistic. Like this is just how <laughs> bros in the army are. Like this could actually happen. <laughs> Wow. And, like, there had been so much, like, built up, like, tension, especially on, like, Moshi's side of, like, really being in love with him. And, yeah. like, s- the moment Gumong showed any sort of weakness, he was like, I'm on it. <laughs> so Moshi was in love with Gumong. Oh, yeah. Moshi was very in love with Gumong. And, and Gumong is dumb. <laughs> dumb, and, yeah. dumb and gay. Gumong obviously had some sort of affection for him, whether yeah. he knew yes. it or not, going into this. Yeah, kind of absolutely. So, uh, from Moshi's perspective, he's like, <laughs> this guy that I'm like secretly in love with is showing me porn and like and I can see he's now has a boner He's like we're doing this. Yeah, and he is so right for that. Wow. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy fucking birthday So that's what Gumong remembers. So yeah, so to go back to come back to reality here Gumong No other memories really except for some for weird lingering guilt that he like caused the death of thousands of loyal soldiers that he cared for deeply Wakes up and is like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it's like, first of all, he's like, I don't even know what happened. Like, Moshi yells at me all the time and he looks so sad all the time. But we used to like hold hands and laugh and smile together and roll around in bed and it seemed like great. It seemed great. Why don't we why don't we do that anymore? I don't understand. And he's like piecing it together. Like, Moshi keeps saying that like we used to know each other. So like, was that real? Right. And so he's like, I'll ask him about it. <laughs> and so he goes pokes him awake, because they happen to be, like, together. Goes and pokes him awake, and is like, hey, I had a dream about you. Moshi wakes up, he's so sleepy. And this is where we get the the tender hand kissing scene, where he, like, doesn't even know he's awake yet, and he just kisses Gumong's hand, and is just, like, pining so deeply. Oh my god. And he's like, mom, I threw up. <laughs> <laughs> mom, I threw up. <laughs> And he wakes up, he's like, what? I dreamed about you. He's like, I don't care. He's like, it was a sexy dream. <laughs> he doesn't know what sex is. So that's not what he says. Oh he's, my God. Like, he's like, yeah, it was, our, it was your birthday. He's like, what? <laughs> oh my God. And he's like, okay. And just proceeds to like avoid him for like the next day, <laughs> week, for so long. He's like, he's like, I don't want to talk about it. He's like, are you going to explain yet? Mm-mm. He's like actively avoiding him now. He's like, I actually, I got into this thinking I wanted him to get his memories back and I absolutely do not want that to happen. I regret all of those oh things. Oh my god, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. It's so good. So how did Gumong screw up so badly on this one? So, yeah, so we got that whole scene. And it's like, they had it all. They were like actually together. How on earth did they get this way yeah what happened what how did this all fall apart how do you want to stab your princess yeah what the hell so and like especially because at this point we've gotten enough juicy flashbacks where we were like we they both cared about each other so much and Mong especially like really wanted to take care of him like wh- why is it that moshi's feelings of adoration and love like why didn't that reach Mong or why didn't Mong accept those like why did they drift apart at some point yeah. And we finally get those feelings explained. Okay. As Gumong is remembering, like, certain memories, like, we finally, as the reader, get the perspective that we've been missing. As Moshi moves up in the world, like, he, he promises Gumong all of the things he wants to give back to him in return for taking care of him. He says, like, I will give you everything, like, this world has to offer, like, like, because I'm a noble, because I have this power, like, we're gonna, like, move up together, we will, like, carve out a place for, to, like, to be together forever, and I will give you a home. And this is what Gumong wants to hear the most. Yeah. Like, this resonates with him the most, like, that he wants to have a home. But... Sounds j- also just like that girl. Yep. <laughs> so, but, he still can't accept what Moshi is saying, and so we finally get a peek at his perspective here. Okay. The future Moshi had painted for him was so beautiful. The young man in his memories seemed to have pledged that oath with his whole life, his heart, his body, his passion, and all of his love. Gumon could tell at once he had wanted to believe it, so much so that he had ached and shivered and nearly shattered. He had wanted to take Moshi's hand, to throw caution to the wind, and heedlessly trust him and love him. But despite all this, in the end, he was too afraid. 
Moshi was the darling of the heavens, a descendant of Chuanghua's nobility, the fourth in a line of generals, and Gu Meng was nobody. This love was too heavy, he couldn't bear its weight. He knew there would come a day when Moshi would grow up, grow wiser, and come to know that his feelings for Gu Meng were nothing but the impulse of his youth. A life was a very long time. The one accompanying him through it would never be a lowly and base-born slave. No! But it seemed that he hadn't confessed any of this to Moshi back then. So even though he's having these doubts, he didn't even manage to voice that to Moshi. Because if he did, they could have probably talked it over. Yeah. As That's so sad. Like his own like self-worth got in the way of like believing in Moshi's words. And like Gu Meng like is actively like proving like all of these things wrong to the emperor to like the army to the nobility he's like moving up in the world too like he's he's already like broken so many barriers as like the first slave to like receive a bunch of honors and stuff so like in so many ways he has had the self-confidence like to really change the world and make it a better place but in this one thing he has no self-confidence that trauma runs deep Oh. As he recalled it now, he realized that it was because he'd been afraid of this as well. Voicing these thoughts would have constituted a wretched defeat. He already had so little, he could not afford to hand over the sincerity of his heart. To the gentry, the slave's heart didn't count for much. It could be broken, toyed with, discarded, or even crushed underfoot. But to him, this little heart was all he had, the only thing he had to his name in his life. That's just very Chuaning coded. <laughs> How Chu Anning's like, I shan't let Moran know of my feelings for yes. if he were to break my heart, I would wither away. It's true. It's true. It's the exact same. So Moshi could love and break taboos with him in a moment of rash impulse, but Gu Meng had no such luxury. Fate had its own hierarchy. Such was life, as loath as he was to admit it. Even if he closed his eyes, he couldn't hide from the truth. Fate had dealt him a meager hand. What Moshi wanted, he couldn't give. What Moshi gave, he couldn't bear. That's really sad. It is. It's like Moshi like, can put his feelings on the line because like, if that fails or he changes his mind, he, he will still okay. has everything going for him. I love that a man can be so self-aware of his own shortcomings mm -hmm. and emotion. And like, he's pretty much saying, like, I would die of a broken heart. Yeah. Like That's this. So it's so sad. It's so. <laughs> it hurts. I know. I know. Meat bun does this so well. You too. My tummy hurts. <laughs> so we finally understand, like, because we've only gotten Moshi's perspective of like Gumong being flippant with him and brushing him off and not taking him seriously. And it's not because he didn't feel the same way. It's because he felt even more. Yeah. Yeah. Like yep. feeling it in my spleen and my and my boob. <laughs> The angst is in your boob. Maybe that's where my heart is. I don't know. <laughs> so in the present timeline, they go to a banquet. Um, and this is kind of like uh, Moshi is showing, basically. The emperor asked, specifically asked um, for him to bring Gu Mang. And this is kind of show, hey, you got this guy under control. Can yeah. you take him to parties? Will he behave himself or will he like piss in the corner? Like, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and at the banquet, um, another character... Another uncle of somebody. Uh huh. <laughs> Zhang Yashui is okay. um, this guy who's in a wheelchair. He's very nice. He's the only one who. Um, he's kind of like an old army bro of both of them. Okay. And so he talks to Gumong privately. Gumong is kind of run off in a corner. He's like, hey, does everyone also hate you? And he's like, yep, sure do. Just two lonely loners together, aren't we? And he kind of takes the time to explain to Gumong all the things Moshi has refused to explain to him. Because Gumong's like, hey, I'm so confused about Moshi. He seems so sad and mad at me all the time. Yeah. And this guy is the first one to actually sit him down and be like, yeah, you guys used to be really close. Like, really, really close. close. And uh, he hates you, but he's also the person who least wants to hate you in the whole world. Like, Gumong stared at him in confusion. So, are you also an old friend of mine? Yes, Jiang Yue replied. We risked life and limb together. He sighed softly. So, I can't hate you. Gu Meng looked down, but Moshi hates me. Jiang Yeshui chuckled, dark eyes gleaming with a peaceful, clear light. You're not wrong, although, out of all the men in the world, he's probably the one who least wants to hate you. A pause. Really? Yes. So, it's kind of showing that, like, he, even though he does genuinely hate you, he also wishes he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. kind of says the most. It's more than saying, like, it's, he could have said, like, yeah, but he also loved you. Yeah. Like, that's, way like, more way more that. potent. potent. 
And so he explains to Gumong like that he treated like like hey Moshi treated you really well in the past. He did all of these things like he rescued you. He he when you received honor, he was happier for you than any of his own achievements. When you made jokes, he was always the one who watched you and laughed first, oh. even though he's such a serious person. Oh my god! But oh my. you've forgotten all of this, and so <sighs> he keeps explaining to Gumong like all of like the good memories that they had together and just kind of like try and say hey I need you to see Moshi's side of this this is why he's acting this way towards you he yeah. did care for you once um, and he said hey if you hadn't abandoned him and hurt him if you hadn't crossed his lines and violated his deepest taboos how could he hate you he's like, he's like hey bro it's your fault he hates you um, he was always protecting you he was willing to shield you from against any hardships but you stabbed him from behind literally yeah. And figuratively. Yeah. And so he actually gives us a missing piece of the puzzle as well. He says, Gumong, you became a traitor. And more than anything in this world, Moshi cannot stand traitors. Because his father was killed by a traitor. Mm. Back in the Dize, uh, Moshi's father um, was also a general. And his right-hand man defected to the other side and sold him out and ended up causing his death. This whole thing is A2 Brute. A2 Brute. A2 Brute. A2 Brute. This whole thing. Oh Yeah. So this is deeply personal for Moshi in a way that like we as the reader didn't even know until now. Like out of everything in the world, this is like Moshi's deepest trauma, his deepest grief, like that his father was betrayed and killed. Moshi also put his heart on the line too. Like, he was openly loving him. Yeah. Like, he was... And, like, here's the thing. Moshi was also willing to, like, believe that Gumong wasn't a traitor up until the very moment he stood in front of him and asked him. And Gumong laughed at him and said, like, you're an idiot. Like, he absolutely, like, denounced any hope that he had for him and said to his face that, like, he had changed side. Like, yeah. he was willing to give him every benefit of the doubt. And Gumon was doing all of this because of his like fucked up self worth issues, and he needed to get more powerful. And this going to the dark side was like the only way. And like I get, I get it. Like you understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As well, I, it's still like it's just crazy to me that like it's like how well, you'd think that even if he ch he became a traitor or changed sides, like how could he stab him in the back? How could he like turn his back on Moshi as well after all he did? It's like it's so heartbreaking. Yeah. Maybe because it would, it's one of those things like not looking back to parallel the straight story again to yeah. protect both sides. It's like, if I stab him, he's gonna really know. He's gonna. <laughs> oh. Yeah. My spleen. Oh, I know, baby. <gasps> That's good. That's good writing. <laughs> That's good. Meanwhile, at the party, next slide. Ooh, the drama. <laughs> Princess Mengjue deserves better and Moshi knows it. Gumong has no idea what is going on, but he hates it. Okay, so while Gumong is finally getting like this lore that he so desperately needs, mm -hmm. Moshi is having a private moment outside in the romantic moonlight with Princess Mengjue. And he's like ushered Gumong out of the room and like Gumong is like, wait a second, like, She's really pretty. Why no. do I feel weird about this? No! Everyone in the capital ships Moshi and Princess Mengjia. I don't! <laughs> but listen, let, let me give Princess Mengjia some credit here, okay? Is she a lesbian? <laughs> no, she loves him. Oh. oh. She loves him. Fuck her! <laughs> listen! Oh, no, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're thinking, but she deserves better. Okay. They have, they go back real far. Okay, so Princess Mengjia used to be an extremely powerful cultivator. Nowadays, she's chronically ill. Okay. And what is it with all these women just be dying <laughs> left and right? Like, if you're in Donmei, you're not gonna, your life expectancy, way low. You're okay. gonna get sick. <laughs> 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 the air is just toxic. It's a boy's only novel. Anyways, um, but she sacrificed her cultivation and her powers to save Moshi. When Gumong stabbed Moshi in the back, Moshi was dying, actively dying, and he would have died if Princess Mengjia did not save his life. Oh my god. And she gave up again. She better be invited to the wedding. <laughs> she gave it up 
for Moshi because she genuinely cared for him and, and loved him. And this was also knowing that Moshi did not care for her in the same way. Love it. She just followed her feelings and saved his life. And so she also is, so again, she's very deeply connected to this betrayal that happened with Moshi. And so she knows that Moshi has these um, kind of, he's that he's kind of trapped in the past and that his feelings for Gumong are just so extreme, you know, yeah. whether it's hatred or camaraderie, like she gets it. But also she's like, I was there when the betrayal happened and the betrayal fucking sucked. And you, I understand that- <laughs> Stop liking this guy. Like, like, I understand that like you're going through it and you're still processing things, but like she genuinely wants the best for him. And she's, she's obviously like, she's not, she literally meets Gumong there and Gumong's like, you're so pretty. Oh, there's a leaf in your hair. Hello. And it's just like, cause Gumong, <laughs> it's like he's elf. <laughs> and she's just like, she's polite to him and nice to him. Cause she understands that he's a fucking furry. Yeah. And not the original OG Gumong, even though she has every reason to genuinely hate him because he almost killed the man she loves. Okay. I respect her. She deserves all the respect. Okay. And Moshi genuinely cares for her yeah. as like someone who is like mad cool and who like, who, Thanks for who giving me your kidney. Yeah, who gave up so much for him without asking for anything in return. Yeah. And without, while knowing that, like, like she wouldn't have changed anything, no matter how many times, if this happened again. Wow. And like, he knows that she cares for him and he just knows that he's unworthy. And he respects her so much for, like, being cool about it, essentially. Yeah. And like, for... She could have gone, like, yandere on his ass. And I would have respected her even more for it. <laughs> but like... <laughs> But, and she genuinely cares for him and like she's genuinely like a good friend to him and like she's one of the few people that Moshi like explicitly has led into his heart. Like he does care for her and he feels like this kind of complicated feeling of like it's more, it's not just guilt. Yeah. Like he feels guilt but it's more than that. It's like guilt and respect and like genuine care and just so much and he's just, he's he knows that he's not capable of of loving her yeah. in the way that she deserves. It's just like genuine non-misogynistic respect for a woman. Yes, literally. <laughs> he respects her so much. And like and like Moshi like canonly also like he just he doesn't get women. He doesn't like women. He's gay. He is legitimately gay. Gumong, okay. you could argue like maybe like seems more bi like because he canonly like really likes women and thinks that they're pretty mm -hmm. and like he maybe like isn't like, and he does like fool around with women like canonly in his past and stuff. Yeah. Um, even though it's not as much as people think. Right, right. Um, so like whether you're not, like however you interpret that, it's very different from Moshi being like straight up like, I don't know how to cope with women. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they so they have a talk over kind of, over things and kind of just have a chat and Gumong sees them together and like is kind of experiencing some interesting feelings over that of like not, really enjoying that <laughs> kind of a little bit of jealousy yeah i thought that was interesting and so in this volume just in this volume alone there have been like actual several like really iconic female characters and so we have hong xiao who had this like incredibly tragic story um very deeply compelling and she's just like a really fun likable character in her life we have Madame Jung, who's like very mysterious, but also extremely powerful in her own way, taking control of like the situation with the sword spirit and seeming to have a, quite a few cards up her sleeve. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure she's gonna become relevant again. Yeah. And Princess Mengjia is just absolutely like powerful, like both in her social status, in her demeanor, like in her past cultivation skills. Um, and even now is just continuing to have like this incredible dignity as a person and I just like really appreciated seeing that because like there's not a lot of like significant female characters sometimes in certain Donme novels and like this uh, like this volume really showed like a nice like diversity of like female characters that you really like and they're not just like there to fulfill some sort of role in the plot yeah or move a plot along or like just cause some sort of thing to happen no they're like good characters yeah that's so awesome that's really cool I really enjoyed that yeah um, and it's definitely like one of the highlights of the volume for me so to kind of like where the book wraps up for this volume is um, at the feast that they're at, at this banquet, um, a bunch of the other nobles gang up on Moshi and try to get him wasted. Oh. Moshi has a very high tolerance for, for alcohol, 
but they just keep toasting him and like really just they want to see him make a fool of himself mm -hmm. especially since people are not happy that Goomong is not dead and see right. him as an obstacle to that yeah Goomong stands up to defend him during that feast Aww. and is basically saying as like because he is my lord and master as a servant I will accept this toast on his behalf like kind of like pulling off like like this kind of really epic thing and of course he's immediately like ridiculed and they like they immediately like it kind of starts a bar fight essentially <laughs> <laughs> like like they just all gang up on him and he but he's like saying hey look why are you ganging up on him i see that you're bullying him don't do that yeah why do you keep mentioning you keep toasting like his father you keep mentioning his dad don't you know that his papa died he's so sad about that why would you say that <laughs> like the innocence. the innocence like just absolute innocent devotion um and it's kind of an interesting shift because gumong is kind of like thinking in animalistic terms and but he's getting more of a, a kind of a human sense of consciousness where he is becoming very attached to Moshi and senses that he also needs protecting and is kind of understanding more of the context surrounding their relationship. So that was an interesting shift. Moshi uh, um, is very drunk, but he's also trying to protect Gumong. He's like, because Gumong is now getting ganged up on and physically attacked and he's like, don't touch him, that sort of thing. Yeah. But they end up in a big ruckus. Um, and that is kind of where the book is leaving off with these memories resurfacing with a, uh, the beginning of a shift in the relationship and it's very intriguing i i wonder for their relationship to work mm -hmm. perhaps gumong did have to go under a full reset of what it is for his self a full reset for his sense of self mm -hmm. in order to be able to be the type of person that could accept Moshi's love. I think so. I think I mean things got so twisted between them in their in their past that it's like I mean obviously you can't redo the past but um, it really does take a drastically different perspective. It's like they have to rebuild up something together and it's almost like this new version of Gumong like it you know, there's almost more hope for something being built between them in the future than if like Gumong just instantly switched back, like had all of his memories, like it wouldn't necessarily be better for them. It's not like they could like hold hands and be like, ah, oh, I missed you so much. Like there's so much like pent up feelings, you know, yeah. there between them, like not even be t about their love for each other, but just about society at large. Mm -hmm. So maybe now that he has Moshi as he's learning his memories and his past trauma, having him with him work through those emotions instead of experiencing those emotions alone and then having someone kind of promising that they could fix those issues, maybe he will be able to accept it in the future. I hope so. <laughs> um, I, like, with the first volume and now the second volume, like, at first I was a little frustrated with, like, how, like, the progress seemed really slow going. Like, it's like, how long is he going to be a dog? Like, Dude, let's be real. <laughs> the first novel, like... It kind of seemed like it wasn't your favorite, but this sounds really good. <laughs> this is definitely a lot less, like, I mean, like, the first novel was, like, so sad. Yeah. So sad. Yeah. At least, like, there's definitely a little bit, like, more lightheartedness in this volume. But um, I looked up, like, the amount of chapters. So Yuu has, like, over, like, 200 chapters total. And, like, in comparison, I think, like, Arha has, like, 350. Like, oh, it's, wow. It's a very, this is a very long book this We're is a very long series like there's i think like doing the math like i think there should be like seven or eight volumes maybe published by seven c's when all this is said and done so like putting like the full big picture of the story into perspective um i think the pacing is actually like very fair for what it is yeah. like i'm not like it's hard not to be impatient but like clearly we have a long way to go before like these major plot points are resolved right. so that makes a lot more sense i was expecting this to be wrapped up a lot sooner so yeah. now i know that we're kind of in for a long long journey here yeah yeah wow. yeah so some of the highlights for this volume was definitely seeing those like really cool female characters unexpectedly kind of make an appearance yeah um, and promise just like some really like well-developed characters all around not just like the main couple being like really fully fleshed out but some interesting side characters developing um Chuaning lookalike is always a win in my book. Um, but there was like so many like tender, like passionate flashbacks between these two. Like not just the spicy scene, which is a huge highlight, but like a lot of like 
no matter what the present timeline is going through, you have like those really sweet, angsty, tender moments between them that are just kind of sprinkled throughout. Like, it's so worth, like, I could go through so much just for those flashbacks. Yeah. And we get like so many of them in this volume. And it just makes you really like yearn and pine as if you were in Moshi's place. There's some growing intrigue as well because we've got this Woshi of the Lao Kingdom mm -hmm. kind of still running amok, being evil. Stop that. <laughs> I'm gonna spritz you. No, <laughs> no simping for villains. He's gone too far. <laughs> the genocide we can excuse, but not the misogyny. Yes. <laughs> you can excuse genocide. <laughs> so we've got some, some growing intrigue there on that front and also some growing intrigue as Gumong is recovering more memories. So I'm really curious to see like how far that develops in the third volume. If we really see them on more equal footing or if that's a long ways off still. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. And all of this angst made me forget about the whale. <laughs> And the whale is the best part, obviously. You have absolutely convinced me that this is an amazing series. Like, I'm, I am love that kind of painful angst that's just so deeply rooted in mm -hmm. love. One thing I wanted to point out is that there are some really beautiful parallels between like the first and second volume book covers where um, Gumong is standing in the background of the first volume and Moshi is kneeling in front of him. And then in the second volume, it's Moshi who is standing, facing the same direction, the wind's blowing the same direction, and then it's Gumong like kneeling in front of him. And just like the past versions of them and the present versions of them side by side like that. I wonder if the third one will have them both standing. I'm really excited to facing see it. Facing the same yeah, direction. Like, like or what? facing each other. Yeah, because also like the backgrounds and the colors like all really match very well. Like those just visually like are so compatible with each other. Like I'm really interested in like, I feel like seeing the third volume cover will say a lot about what's inside. Yeah. Well, thank you so much Stitch for another incredible PowerPoint. If you guys would like to buy Remnants of Filth volume one or two, <laughs> you can use the links down below. And if you like, hanging out with us and you want to hear more of our <laughs> candid thoughts a little bit less censored, <laughs> you can join my YouTube membership. Any tier is able to join our live streams and we've been doing them once a week on Friday nights, usually to talk about the new TGCF episodes. So <laughs> be sure to join right now is a very exciting time. We chat about our favorite danme. It's a super safe space. The community is so much fun. And yeah, it's yeah. a great way to support us because this is what we do full time. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye. <laughs>